We're uh, a little over a month into the new year, and there were a lot of people at the beginning of the year said, I'm going to give up doing this and this, and I'm going to give not eat these things because, well, I want to get in better shape, and I want to lose weight, and things like this. And We're willing to give up things for ourselves, thinking that we can make things better in our lives. Are we willing to give things up for the sake of other people. I'm Pastor Tim Holscher, and we are looking at what God has done for us so that we can get along as believers. Essentially, we're talking about promoting unity in the body of Christ. We've been in Romans 12 for the last couple studies, where we find that there are believers that have that are immature, believers that are mature, and the immature believers do not know some of the promises from God. They do not understand promises that assure us that we cannot be separated from the love of God. They do not understand the promises that God is going to finish in us what he started. And therefore, uh, they, they worry that their actions uh, might in some way impair, damage their salvation. I don't think these people thought they could lose their salvation, but I think that they they thought in some way that it might damage it, uh, and damage it in terms of damaging the relationship that we as believers have to God. And so Paul is addressing both sides of this group on the best thing to do, and one of the things he's encouraging them to do is for the, the believers who are mature, the believers who are strong in the faith, to to put these other believers first and not to look down their nose and despise them. So in verse 21, and he just said, and let's go back and read verse 20 here because it is a very important thing. He says, do not tear down work uh, with the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean. In other words, there really is from God's point of view, there really is no unclean meat. We'd say, well, why did God declare some meats unclean in the Old Testament. tells us in Leviticus, it was designed to make a distinction, a difference between Israel and the Gentiles that were around them. That was the reason. It was to make things different. It wasn't because there was a natural uncleanness or cleanness to certain meats. And everybody always wants to find an order, but they miss the important point that God was trying to show Israel how hard it is to really be different. And so he says, all things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the person who eats and causes offense. Verse 21, it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother or sister stumbles. I, I've i mentioned this before. I mean, I'm a person that can enjoy a really good hamburger. I enjoy a really, a really good steak. And when you look at those things, the thought of giving that up and saying I'm going to eat a I'm going to eat a vegetarian lifestyle um, for the sake of other believers, not for my own sake, but for the sake of other people that might be concerned about eating meat for fear that it might that it might be have have been offered to an idol. Um, that that would be a tough decision to make, but it would be as what Paul's saying the right one. In fact. Paul is going to say here, I I would give these things up uh, forever. I actually think that's over in 1 Corinthians 8 that he makes that statement. But he says it's good not to eat meat meat, or to drink wine. Now, of the things, Sabbath and eating meat offered idols are not issues that really are, are common in our culture today. Drinking of wine, now that one can be. That can be something that... Um, especially in the culture I grew up in, uh, people that drank uh, alcohol in any form, um, I, because of the way I was raised, I was always highly suspect about whether or not those people, you know, are they really believers? And and God eventually kind of worked on me even growing up on some of those issues, but it was still something that a lot of believers had trouble with. And to this day, a lot of believers have problems with this. And it may not even be that the drinking of wine is something that that a person um, has a problem with because of a religious issue. But I know people that have come out of backgrounds where they had family members that were alcoholics or they themselves were alcoholics and they don't want to be around it. And they really associate with that, with the way they were before they were saved, before God uh, freed them from that that slavery to that problem. And therefore, for their sake, these were the types of things that 
you know, we could be willing to give up. So this is still, I would say, a modern thing that, that we could think about. That maybe if we have people like that in our lives, that those are choices that we should think about doing. Um, and, I, and I only say that because our, our church culture today is very different than when I was growing up. The church culture that I grew up in, nobody drank. Well, not to my knowledge, nobody, nobody of the believers I ever knew drank. Uh, which I learned was not true. I actually had some some believers close to me that did, but it was they did it just so on the down low that it was never an issue. But really, ninety nine percent of the believers I knew did not drink when I was growing up, and now we have a, a culture, uh, probably the forty and under culture uh, in church culture today. It, to them, it's not a big deal. I, my wife and I went to a to a, a German restaurant. Oh, probably a dozen years ago, and we were sitting down to eat, and this group came in, and I noticed that they all sat down, and they put Bibles down around the table that they were sitting, and there was probably, I don't know, eight or ten people around this table, and the, the waitress came, and they ordered, and I noticed when they came back that that several of them were drinking beer. They had they had brought steins of beer to their table for some of the different people in there. But these people then opened their Bibles and then they read some scripture and then they prayed. And then while they were waiting for their food, they were essentially doing a little bit of a Bible study sitting around the table. And it was just like, wow, our it's a real cultural shift in the way that we think. Um, that might be offensive to you to find that out, but for me it was just it was shocking because it was so different than than what I grew up around. But it's all just a reminder that we do have a cultural shift. And so that's why I think that this is one that I think is still something that as believers we need to think about um, if we have believers in our lives that have these issues. So he says, I don't want to do anything. So as I said, there's other things that we could do in our lives. And, and who knows what that might be? Something that actually might cause a brother or sister here, and we have this word to stumble, that actually... Uh, trips them up in their progress. Verse 22, the faith which you have, have as your own conviction or just have it to yourself. In other words, if you have faith in God's promise that those things are not going to be a problem, Paul says, have it to yourself. We have it as your own conviction. But literally, just, just keep it here. You don't need to go, well, I don't, you, you know, there's other people that have problems. You don't have to be praying and going, well, I don't have problems with that because I believe God's promise and nothing's going to mess me up. And there's, you can share that promise in a very, very kind, very nice way in a setting that is helpful to people. But sometimes people are like, I don't have a problem with that because why I believe God's promise. And they basically quote this, this thing of faith that they have. My faith is so great that I don't have problems with this. And they do that running roughshod over believers that do have problems with that. And they do it. Not because they're trying to help those believers get this promise. They're doing it because they do not want to have to give anything up for anybody else. Remember, we're talking about getting along. This is a good way to cause division and problems in the lives of believers. So he says, if you have faith, have it to yourself before God. Happy is the one who does not know, condemn himself in the thing which he approves. He says, you can condemn yourself. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 8, when you run roughshod over another believer that has issues of sensitivity, Paul says, you sin against the Christ. Well, here he uses, who does not condemn himself. And condemn is not the same word we have in chapter 8, verse 1. This is simply the word crino. It's just to judge. He judges himself in this. He, in other words, he, he brings some judgment because when your actions negatively affect others in the body of Christ, those are the number one places where you see that God disciplines believers. I'd, he may discipline each of us privately for things to try to get our attention, but if our actions are going to affect negatively other people, those are the things that we see the most examples of God disciplining others for. Verse 23, but the one who doubts is, and we do have this stronger word, condemn here now, is condemned if he eats. Now you'd say, well, how does this work with Romans 8.1? Well, Romans 8.1 says we're not condemned if we're in Christ. This is talking about coming under some sort of a judgment or condemnation if he eats because he is eating it not from faith for whatever is not from faith is sin. Now, I've had people that have taken this in a very 
strict sense that everything you do in life has to be by faith. You go to the grocery store, you buy your groceries by faith. You get in your car and you drive downtown, you go uh, take a vacation, you do it all by faith, everything by faith. But we're, we're missing in the context that what Paul is saying here is that if there are things that you have promises from God, because that's what you have to have. You have to have a promise from God related to this. If you have a person that doesn't know that promise or maybe has heard it, but they don't believe that promise, really? You mean I could eat this meat offered to idols and it's not going to, it's, it's not going to separate me from God's love? Really? Are you sure? Well, you're eating it. You're more mature than me. So, okay, I'll eat this meat. But the whole time they're doing it in doubt, as he says back up here at the first part of this, then uh, for that person, that's sin. Because they are moving, they're, they're actually intentionally moving beyond the boundaries. They are, they're looking at what God's doing and they're thinking, I am judged. This is a problem. I'm doing this, but I'm doing it because that more mature believer is doing it. And they're not doing it for the right reason and not doing it for the right reason actually brings them into some problems and it even puts them in a position now are they condemned by god i think this condemnation is a condemnation personally i think this is condemnation themselves within themselves they judge themselves they look at law as they understood it because that's one of these things that they'd have and their heart is going to be condemning them in this matter this is the way i understand this because god doesn't condemn us for doing something like this, not in faith, because he doesn't condemn us if we're in Christ. This condemnation, I really think, is something that is within us. But it is nonetheless, it is sin, because that person is intentionally going contrary to what they think God has for boundaries for them at that moment in time. And that's what sin is. I know, God, what you said, but I'm going to do it this way anyway. You and that it becomes the problem here. So I hope, hopefully this helps us, just to help us remind us just how serious this is uh, when we look at these things. We just look at these first verses of chapter 15, which go along with this. It says, now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of the weak, of those who are without strength. It's not the same word for weakness that we have here, those that lack strength or are not strong, and not to please ourselves. Again, this is exactly what we were talking about, about running roughshod over these people, because it's about pleasing us. Each of us is to please his own neighbor for his good, for his, we, we want to do that which is going to bring him a sense of well-being and for his edification. And then he illustrates that Christ, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the taunts or the ridicule of those who taunt or ridiculed you have fallen on me. In other words, they ridiculed God. Jesus Christ was the object that bore that ridicule that those people of Israel had against God. He's the one, he was the one that they could really throw or heap their problem upon them. So even Jesus Christ demonstrated it's not about pleasing you. It's not just about doing what you want, what makes you happy, what makes you feel good. It's about thinking about others in the body of Christ. And doesn't that go back to one of the things we've talked about many times in the Bible studies on this, on this channel, is that Christ left us a command, and that command is to love one another. And oftentimes as Christians, we are not defined by our love for one another. We're defined by all kinds of other things that actually have a very negative impact, a very negative testimony, I should say, for who we are as believers, for what the body of Christ is, for who God is. And we ought to be thinking more about others than about ourselves. And that would even mean giving up things that cause an offense to other believers. And by cause offense, I mean in the context of both here in 1 Corinthians, encouraging them to do it even though they don't believe the promise. That's the offense. It's not that they sit around and go, I'm offended by what they did. That is not what Paul means by the offense. He's talking about that it encourages them to act in that same way, but not in faith. Think about your brother in Christ. Always be considering are your actions, are your words, 
Are they helpful to them or are they a hindrance? I encourage you with that, to see one another in Christ, to look out for one another. And you do that first and foremost by having a good day there in the Lord at the Father's right hand. And as always, thank you for joining me.